Hello and welcome to the East London Knit Podcast. My name is Renee. Thank you for joining me. This episode is brought to you by a sweater for Lucille, which is just because I happen to be wearing it today. A sweater for Lucille was part of the Recollection collection and um, is available in book form. And um, I wasn't going to do a promotion or anything, I just happened to be wearing it, so it seemed like a good idea to mention it. <laughs> I have an interview today with Kate Atherley, who I caught up with at uh, Yarn Porium. She's another one of those lovely designers that I I grabbed just uh, for a few minutes of chat about their work. Um, we had the uh, more professional surround of a classroom this time rather than um, her hotel room, which uh, just happened to work out, luckily. Um, Kate is uh, geeky in the best possible way, um, in the way that I really appreciate. I always learn a lot from her articles and her tutorials, and if you are not familiar with them, I highly recommend having a look. All the um, links are in the show notes in the East London Knit Ravelry group, but uh, for, for you geeky ones out there, this is for you. Hello and welcome. I am here at Yarnporium with the lovely Kate Atherley, who has come all this way to do some uh, teaching and um, book promotion, which we may chat about yeah. shortly. And probably a bit of yarn shopping as well. Well, you know, you know, you know. just the important things, yeah. really. Yeah. <laughs> and we've um, taken over a little empty classroom for a few minutes of chat before it all gets started. And I wondered if you could do a little introduction of yourself and your work, how you got in to, um, you know, yarn and all this good stuff for the kids at home. Yeah, so I've always been a knitter. I actually am one of those people. I just don't remember learning how to knit. I was always with my granny and she was always a knitter and a crocheter and it just there was always yarn. So I just did. Mm. Um, you know, I never remember the first time I held the needles, but it just it kept going throughout my life. And it sort of waxed and waned depending on how busy I was with other things, homework chasing boys, you know, teenage things. But when I finished university, I suddenly had time on my hands and I happened to be at the time living in Toronto, a five minute walk from a huge and ridiculous yarn shop. And it's one of these, it's yeah, it's an absolutely amazing place. It's just a, almost a huge warehouse of yarn. And there's an entire wall of sock yarn. Um, and it's not a London-sized wall, it's a Toronto-sized <laughs> no, wall for clarity. There's a context Yes, <laughs> an entire wall of sock yarn. And I had remembered that my gran had knitted socks. Mm. And I thought, oh, I should give that a go. And, you know, as they say, the rest is uh, history. Mm. Um, what happened with, uh, I cooked up this plan, I bought this sock knitting book and decided to knit my way through it, which taught me a lot about making mistakes mm. and taught me a lot about what I couldn't couldn't do and it taught me a lot about sock fit as well so fit's something that's always been important to me throughout my uh, sort of knitting career it, but it was a hobby for many years and then a friend opened a yarn shop and you you know these words come out of your mouth and you don't even know that you're going to say them she said oh I'm, I'm opening a yarn shop and and I, I had no idea I said oh I'd love to teach mm -hmm. oh really do I? Because <laughs> um, I was doing training in my work, in my day job, and I was like, oh, I can teach knitting. It's going to be better than teaching people about document management software. Is that what your Yeah, day well, job so yeah, so I have a degree in mathematics, and I worked in different software industries. I worked for a uh, company that did a mathematical programming language, so that was, you know, obviously general interest. Uh, and then I was doing document management, but I actually finished my career working for a company that did online media services and online music services, which was very cool, but not knitting. Um, and so, but I, mean, I was, it was cool, but, but yeah, right. Um, not that cool. And so I was doing training and I was doing documentation and there's a common thread here. And I uh, started teaching classes and eventually there was more of it than the day job. And uh, so I gave up the day job and now do it full time. So I teach, I write books, I do technical editing in the background as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, it keeps me out of trouble. Yes. I mean, you know. It, it's a uh, more than full time sounds yeah. like yeah. <laughs> well and with all of us you know we do these these things that we adore yeah it's it's different you know you combine your hobby with your work and I will never complain but it does you don't leave the office at five o'clock on a Friday no it also changes the nature of your love for the thing yeah I think. I, yeah for me 
the risk was and sort of the worry was would I not love it anymore mm. if this became my job? And it turned out, no, I still absolutely love it. And I think I love it more. So I think that's a good sign. That is a good sign. Yeah. That's a very good sign. Yes. So I know your work particularly um, from the beginning, I guess, was tech editing yep. for Nitty.com. And, um, and I really thought of that that was like your your thing yeah. was the tech editing thing and didn't know that you had this whole other world that expanded or did that expand relatively recently in terms what came the first? tech editing is actually the most recent addition oh. to my to my sort of knitting portfolio I mean I've been doing it now for a long time but I was a teacher first mm -hmm. and then I was a designer because what happens is if you spend any time in a yarn shop new yarns come in and think oh I should do something with that and then you write it up so you're instantly a designer uh, and then uh, sort of tech editing was last in that but yeah no I started out um, it just helping out people writing out the patterns in the shop and it turned out that my technical writing career and my technical support career in my previous life had a lot of bearing on this. Mm. So, you know, if you can explain very technical software, you can explain it in patterns. I mean, and not, you know, not to minimize either of those tasks, but there's a lot in parallel between the two in terms of communicating processes mm -hmm. and communicating what can be fairly technical processes and concepts to people in an in this easily understood way. Um, and so, yeah, tons and tons of parallels, and I think some of the best technical editors come from that perspective, mm. have that kind of, yeah, technical writing background, and it doesn't have to be software, but, you know, I encounter people who've got backgrounds in sort of even science, like Rachel, for example, I mean, mm. she's a scientist, mm. because we're taught to think about processes and taught to think about replicability of processes, because mm. ultimately with a knitting pattern, the objective is that you write instructions so that someone else can make the thing that's in the picture. Mm -hmm. And you have to think about, okay, is what I have done reproducible? And generally it is. It's rare that you do something in knitting that you can't, sometimes you don't remember what you did. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, think about how to explain that and how to explain that to people with different levels of understanding and different levels of experience. Because I think the pattern writing challenge these days is different because, than it would have been even 30 or 40 years ago because we're dealing with a global audience now. We can't mm. make the same assumptions about what knowledge base people have. Mm. You know, and, and to say cast on has so many different meanings depending on where, you, you know, who taught you, where you're from, whereas 30, 40, however many years ago, you know, you cast on will be, even cast on will be quite regional, mm. let alone you know, what yarns were popular and what techniques were popular. So yeah, no, it's an, it's an, to me it's a fascinating challenge. Mm. As anyone who has ever had a look at um, old Scandinavian knitting patterns in which they say something like, increase evenly and continue. And yes. that's, that's yeah, it, exactly. they're just, you know, yep. there's no instruction in particular. It's there's a, um, like <laughs> a, a lace knitting book, which I really love, called Folk Shawls, and mm. she quotes a vintage lace pattern, and it's effectively, what is it, cast on a goodly number of stitches, <laughs> choose a lace pattern, it had better be simple. You know, and that's about the extent of it. It's like, okay. That's so good. Yeah, it's great. So, um, assumed knowledge, anyone, you know? So, yeah, you, you it's, what do people know? Mm. And, as the pattern writer, as the designer, you have to think about that. And as the editor, I have to think about that. What do I know about what people know? What can I trust that they know? Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, that's a, that's a really interesting perspective. I think it's um, everyone comes to this work in a very particular way, and each journey is, is very much... Um, you know, guided by different principles, and I think it's it's really interesting to hear the the kind of clear calling it yeah. seems that you had to do something very educational, and and I think that that comes through in your book output certainly. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know that we have I have the most recent book here, just sitting here. Yes, very recent in fact. Yes. It's so recent. Yes, um, the Knitter's Dictionary: Knitting Know How from A to Z. Um, which is shiny, shiny and new. Yes. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this particular reference book? Yeah, so, and it, it connects to all of the things I've just been talking about. Um, I have 
wrote a couple of years ago, I wrote a book about how to write patterns to try and capture my knowledge about all of this, all of the, the dry, boring bits about explaining in, you know, the instructions and the details and building a common language for international knitters and all of these things, aimed at designers, I mean, aimed at people like you, Renee, you know. But I realized that there needed to be a counterpart to that and there needed to be a guide to reading patterns. And I hear this a lot in my classes. And when you're in a yarn shop, you're like, yeah, but this is great, but how do you make the leap from knowing what to do with your needles and your yarn to being able to read and execute the instructions? Because they're two completely different skill sets. And typically when you take a learn to knit class or when Gran teaches you to knit or you pick it up at a knit night at a pub or wherever you pick it up, there's no discussion of the words. It's all about this. Mm. And so that book really, if I may give my secret away, it's actually a pattern reading book in disguise. But I also knew that nobody would buy a pattern reading book because that's boring. Um, that feels like homework. So this is an, uh, an attempt to explain all of the terms and all of the language you use in patterns. But it goes beyond that. It's not just for beginners. For example, I've, and I've got tons and tons of illustrations, if I may, let me see. I haven't had it long enough. It is very new. And its official publication date was uh, this week. <laughs> Um, so I'll perhaps let Renee take a still picture of this, but there's so many illustrations and for example necklines. Mm -hmm. I've got an illustrations of all of the different necklines because you know, you're reading a pattern, you're looking at different patterns and it might say that it's got a funnel neck and if you've never, you know, never mm -hmm. encountered, well what's that going to look like? Because mm -hmm. you can't always tell from the picture. So pictures of different neckline treatments, pictures of different colours, pictures of different garment shapes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, as an experienced knitter, as an experienced designer, as someone who, who sort of understands garment patterns, we know inherently what the difference is between satin sleeves and raglans. Mm -hmm. But if it's your first garment pattern, you may not have any idea. So trying to capture all of that wisdom as well and just even things like well when it says increase why are there so many choices and what should I do with them so um, but lots of oh, different hats too <laughs> lots of illustrations and hopefully sort of a user-friendly reference to all the words that you need to know so you know um, in a class there are you know there are other ways to learn what to do with this mm -hmm. I'm all about the words mm -hmm. if that makes sense mm -hmm. so yeah yeah, good, good, um, good idea. I hope it. I hope it's wildly successful. Thank you. And that everyone you. reads patterns better. Yeah, I hope so. But yeah, I shouldn't be telling them that that's really what it is because it's homework. But well, plus, and I just I do love the format. It's this lovely hardcover book. And and again, I don't think this will come through on camera. But the best part is it's a flip book. So there's a little ball of yarn at the bottom of the pages. You can see that, Renee. And then if you flip through it. This is great on camera, right? This is like trying to explain things on radio. But look, the ball of yarn moves. It's the best part. So yeah, very nice. Achievement unlocked. I wrote a flip book. That's but excellent. Yeah. Um, so this is the latest book yes. as well. Yes. Yes. Um, and it wasn't so long ago, it seems to me, that your last book. Yes. Came out. Yeah, um, more by accident than anything, but I've been on a year cycle. So this time last year, my mitten book came out, all about mittens and gloves. Before that was pattern writing, and before that was a book about sock knitting. So um, yeah, I, um, hopefully that's enough for people for a while because I think. Oh, um, I mean next year. You got to tell us what's coming yeah, next year. Yeah, no, next year, not <laughs> next year. So yes, I'm cooking up something, mm. uh, but it will probably be two because it's a long lead when you're working with a publisher. Mm. Um, so it's it's sort of a two year cycle. So I'm just starting to put the plans together for the next thing. But my books are always, and the next one, uh, will have this in common. They're always sort of teaching tools as well, as you said. It's not just, I don't just write books that are about designs. Because um, it's funny, I love designing, but I'm not, designing isn't how I lead. I'm not the most innovative, I'm not the most creative designer. The designs, I like designing pieces that are really wearable. I like designing pieces that are really knittable as well. And so my books always have an aspect of, yes, there are designs that you can knit, but I also want to teach you about what it is. Mm. So the sock book and the mitten book, it had the first third were all about how to, not just here are some patterns. Because mm. there are lots of marvelous books of sock patterns, but here's some wisdom about how to knit socks and how to make a good yarn choice and how to choose yarn for mittens for warmth, for example. Mm. Um, so yes, that's something I really love delving into too, sort of the, the background behind the, the, you know, the whys and the wherefores. So. Mm. so if I cannot lead you on what your next book 
is, is going to be. Sadly um, not. <laughs> oh, no, fair enough. Yeah. Um, some of the other things that I know you're taking part in are um, a few, actually, uh, well, at least a couple, online um, educational things yep. uh, from Mason Dixon and I think from uh, Knit Mastery as well as yes. something that you seem to yeah. be very active in. And so, I, I mean, I love obviously talking about knitting, obviously. I love writing about knitting and I love helping people make their knitting better. That's, mm-hmm. I think that's really the common thread in anything. And so um, I have a, a video techniques column on Nitty, which is always fun. I just, you know, it's a couple of minutes just, to, you know, at one particular technique. Um, and I write for Stitch Mastery, which is, uh, and I will give a shout out to Stitch Mastery. It's a charting do software. Do Stitch Mastery? Do call well, they do Mastery. Near Mastery as well. Okay. They do some big user applications. <laughs> Stitch Mastery is the, is the tool that I use for charting, and I absolutely mm-hmm. adore it and have started writing a uh, techniques column for them about how to use the software, but also just how to use the software to make your knitting patterns better. Mm. So read it, please. Although your patterns are always very good, so I'm not worried about you. Um, so uh, so aimed at designers. And then what I'm also doing is for uh, this uh, Mason Dixon knitting in the, in the US, I, I write a techniques column where they allow me to dive ridiculously and hilariously deep into one technique. And what motivates all of this is, yeah, I, I, I can perhaps make it seem like I get a bit too academic on things, but ultimately I am a pragmatist mm. because I recognize that we do this as a hobby. Mm. I mean, we ultimately, even we're professionals in the industry, we still do this for fun mm. and it's got to be fun. And I think if we overburden too much with, well, this is how you must do things mm. or this is the one right way of doing things, even something as simple as, discussions about how to hold your yarn. Mm. There are so many different ways of holding your yarn. And from my perspective, as long as the knitter is making stitches, I'm happy. I'm not going to make any comment about it. And I, you know, I'm a laughable crocheter because I'm quite sure I hold my yarn wrong. Um, but it's okay because what results is crochet and what results for people is knitting. Mm. And so I do like to take a pragmatic approach. So in these Mason Dixon columns, I'm like, okay, let's talk about weaving in ends, and let's, but let's talk about ways of making it less arduous, if you will, mm. and practical solutions for different situations. And that's the bit that I adore, mm. because I, you know, I'm ultimately it's like, okay, let's get you to get the thing done so we can wear it, so we can show it off, so you can wear your gorgeous cardigan. Mm. You know, I don't want to necessarily have somebody fuss about, well, what's the one right way to weave in your ends? Or what's the ro- one right way to, mm. to, to join yarn at the end of a row, for example? It really is about the situation. It's really about what works for you. And so I like taking that pragmatic approach and sort of taking the fear out of the, some of it. So I've written articles about weaving in ends, about about um, uh, a slip stitch edge, slip stitch edge, which was the most recent one, which was fantastic. Because yes, I am cited the fact that my mother and I have um, we've we've we have a firm disagreement about it. <laughs> about your edges. So yes, um, so I had to write it very carefully because Mum, I love you, but you do it, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> um, and buttonholes and sewing in zips and all of these kinds of things. And yes, you know, an acknowledgement there there are couture ways of doing it and the acknowledgements there are ways to do it where you just actually get to leave the house wearing a lovely cardigan yeah. Yeah, so. is your mother in the couture not uh, not at all no, no. no not at all but she was taught by a, her mother who's an excellent excellent knitter who had um strong opinions run in my family mm. so yes uh, i think it's also uh, adult passing knowledge onto a child because it's different there are obligations when you're a child as well so there's that sense mm. of Big, one hates to say power imbalance, but when an adult is teaching a child, right, there's a different learning. Yeah, the dynamic, dynamic, is, very dynamic is very different. different. But I think also, though, it's different when you're being taught by someone who has themselves been told there's one right way to do it. Mm. Because I think that's the difference in our world now, because we learn from people who learned in many different places, and we mm. learn from people who learn from many different traditions. Mm. And even something as simple as there are many different ways to, again, hold your yarn. Mm. Um, and I think that what was happening when it was a one-on-one family teaching environment, it would be, well, this is the way I was taught, so this is the way that you you do it. And there may not be, this would be like me te- trying to teach somebody to bake because 
I can, there are, there's a small number of things that I can bake and I am successful at those, but I'm not by any stretch of the imagination experienced or broadly skilled. And so if I teach, if I attempted to teach my husband to make cake, basically so you have to do it this way because it's the only way I know how to do it. Whereas with something like knitting, because you and I, we know lots of different methods, we can be different as instructors. Mm -hmm. So it's a different, it's a different kind of experience, yeah, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. And it's a better experience. I hope. I like to I think hope. it's a better experience. I hope so. I hope so. Yes, it's true. It's true. So yeah. Yeah, excellent. Um, well, do you have, you're teaching some classes. Yes. Um, and so what classes are you teaching this weekend at your Emporium? I'm teaching a class about the pie shawl, which yeah. I adore because it brings together, well, two of my favorite things in the world, which is mathematics and knitting. So it's a win and lace knitting, which is gorgeous. So uh, teaching the pie shawl. And I'm also teaching a class about garment fit and alterations, mm. which to me is a really interesting one because I think that Again, back to how patterns are written. Traditionally, knitting patterns don't do a good job of explaining fit and mm -hmm. size and how to choose a size. And we use all these mysterious words like ease, which aren't helpful either, and even things like bust, where's your bust measurement taken? And I think that, you know, I see a lot of people who could be happier with their garment projects because they don't really get the fit quite right. Mm -hmm. So for me, that class is all about helping people make better garments by making sure the fit is, is correct. And so they know how to measure themselves and they know how to make a good size choice and a good style choice. Mm -hmm. And there's so much to do in upfront. And ultimately, despite the fact that I love the mathematics, my approach is only take on as much of that as you want. And so if you make the right garment choice, the, the right style choice up front, if you make the right size choice up front, you can minimize the number of alterations so that, for example, your sweater's lovely, it's a fantastic fit for you. And so for me, I would look at that and say, okay, so let's look at the site, look at the shape of that. Is that a shape that would work for me? And if it would, and it is fantastic. If it is, you know, I, for me, I'd probably, you're taller than I am, I would probably need to shorten the sleeves a little bit. Rather than choosing something that isn't gonna suit me and then trying to re-engineer it, you know? So mm -hmm. my approach is only take on as much mathematics as you want. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good tip. I think a lot of people shy away from the mathematics. Yeah. And there's probably a good reason. Like yeah. that is not necessarily enjoyable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's and not necessarily complicated either, but but it's risky, mm. right? And so for me, I'm like make the right choice and then simplify the alterations you need to make. Mm -hmm. Um, I give an analogy in my classes about um, when we moved house a couple of years ago. We used to live in this big open concept loft, which was gorgeous and I absolutely loved it. And then we were both starting to work at home, so we needed separate office spaces. And we had someone come in and look at it and say, okay, well, yeah, we can carve out separate office spaces in this big loft, but we'd need to build walls and you'd block, be blocking off the windows and it's no longer a big open concept airy loft at that point. It's a warren of tiny rooms. So we ended up moving to a house that's exactly the same square footage. Mm. It's just a house with rooms and with mm. doors and so I can close my office off at the end of the day. And it's, we had to do less work and we've honored the spirit of the building mm. as opposed to, goodness, that's a pompous, you know what I mean, <laughs> as opposed to having to kind of ruin what was a good open space. So yeah. my approach to garments is, is very much the same. Mm. Begin with something that is 90% of the way there and make those tiny tweaks like, goodness, I did not like the color they'd painted the bedroom, you know? <laughs> uh, and the bathroom door choice was very strange, but that's easier yes. than completely re-engineering re our, our old loft. And I say the same thing about garments. Choose a garment that's right for you and then do the simple stuff like shorten the sleeves as I inevitably have to do, or lengthen the sleeves. As I inevitably have to exactly. do. Exactly, apparently it's possible <laughs> to be tall. Um, so as opposed to taking a garment that looks great on someone else and then having to completely rebuild it. Well, that is good advice indeed, I think. And um, we should probably go get ready to teach some classes. Um, so do you just want to tell us about where we can find you online and 
Um, I will have obviously links to all the things that we talked about, the Mason Dixon knitting and all the good online tutorials and stuff, but you have your own site as well. Yes, so you can find me, I'm very easily Googleable. I'm just kateatherly.com and you can find me on Ravelry and on Twitter as Kate Atherley. Um, I am on Instagram, unfortunately, there's someone else with my name and she beat me to it, but I'm Kate Atherley <gasps> Knits, yes, and she lives in a much warmer climate than I, I do. She's, you know, she looks like a lovely woman and she never wears sweaters. So, uh, but there's information about all of my books, where I will be teaching, and do keep an eye on that because I do come back over to the side of the Atlantic a couple of times a year, which is nice. Mm. Do a lot of travel in North America as well, and so, and when I'm ready to talk about what this mysterious next book project I can't is, believe, I, can't I have uh, won you over. With yeah, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yes, I'm getting very good at this. Uh, but yeah, and so information about about the books that I've written. So there's this one, the brand new one, but the. Uh, mitten book so called knit mitts and custom socks and if you are a designer information about the pattern writing book as well but it's all there yeah and you can also drop me a note by email too if you want to get in touch so excellent thank you so much for Thank chatting with us. thanks for this Kate is like an adorable knowledge pixie when it comes to knitting I think she's <laughs> she's so cute and so full of that good technical gritty stuff in knitting um which I really love um obviously uh you know she's she's prolific with the tutorials and um, there's just a lot to learn there and that's what i love about knitting i love how there's always something new to learn about it um and that she really dives deep in that uh so kate is working with a very professional publisher for her books and so she doesn't have a lot of books to give away but she has very generously offered us a 30 percent discount on her ravelry um store patterns with the code east london knits that code is good until the 3rd of February, so if you're not watching the podcast right away, there still might be time for you to take advantage. She has hundreds of patterns, um, all different kinds of techniques, because like she mentioned in the podcast, that's really her thing, is kind of giving um, a space to explore a technique as much as uh, a finished object design type uh, situation. Um, I, I think that there is something for everyone. If you have a look, just have a browse of her patterns. I think you'll find something that you like. Um, so please do take advantage of that. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to mention today is that uh, right now I should have, if I've done everything that I hope to do today, um, a pattern testing. I have finished the Miara hat and not only that, I've done two versions. I've done a worsted weight version, which I, I gave you a little peek of earlier, and I've done a sport weight version in a kind of gradient. And um, I really love the hat. I love the pattern. I'm excited to do more things with it, but the hat should be available in December. So if you, uh, like someone else I know who happens to do things uh, in a foolish way, um, if you decide not to to do gift knitting and then at the last minute in December think oh actually I should just do a few hats <laughs> just as something to give people um, this is a really great pattern for that and it will be available in December so um, I'm I'm committing to that <laughs> by telling it to you now um, the the worsted weight hat only took me a, co a couple of evenings to knit and that was with, you know, me um, sort of knitting and then ripping out a bit and then knitting and ripping out. So um, it's very doable for the last minute gift uh, knitting that some of us are silly enough to do. Um, next time, hopefully, I'll be telling you all the good details about it. Um, and um, and maybe, you know, do a last minute giveaway, probably on Instagram. I, I tend to do that. But just wanted to throw it out there to um, lay the groundwork for all you last minute knitters. Um, and with that, I think I am all done for this week. Um, I will see you again in a couple of weeks with yet another interview from Yarnporium. And until then, happy knitting and take care. <laughs>